Last week we started celebrating the resurrection anew as Easter people because we recognize that Christ's resurrection isn't just something that we celebrate one Sunday a year, but it is the core of our identity. It's who we are as believers in the risen Lord, that the resurrection is what shapes everything that we do, the way we interact with our community, the way that we interact in our everyday lives, all the places we travel, we have this at the very center of our being, that we are Easter people. And so we say hallelujah. Hallelujah is our song. We give thanks and praise to God at all times and in all places. But we recognize that life is not without its challenges along the way. Even as Easter people, we have so many days and so many nights that it can be filled with pain and frustration. And our gospel story today is like exhibit A of that. Now, for Pastor John, the very thing he first wants to mention about this scripture is the elephant in the room. He says, why is it that the disciples are fishing naked? He just can't wrap his head around why that would be. He wants to know, why is that? Well, some scholars say that they weren't necessarily naked, just underneath their clothing they didn't have anything else. That's why it was important for Simon Peter to re-wrap his robe around himself more tightly as he's going to dive into the water. Um, so I just had to dispel that and, and get the distraction off of John's mind so that we can focus on the Word of God here for all of us. Amen? <clears throat> and you don't know why they went fishing. Well, if you're a fisherman, you know why, right? Because it's just relaxing, maybe quiet chance to just get away, but we, we can't forget the economic realities of these disciples too. I mean, remember, they were used to following Jesus everywhere that he went, and there would be crowds pressing in, and Jesus would make sure they had all the food they needed. He could just take a couple of fish and feed everybody that was there. They'd seen all these miracles happen. When they were with Jesus, they could get invited into people's houses and prepare Meals would be laid out before them. But now they were kind of on their own again. Jesus was appearing from time to time, but they had to figure out the realities of their everyday existence. And Ben Witherington reminds us that it was really an important economic endeavor to be a fisherman in this region in this time. If the fish themselves were not just a source of income, but also just a basic source of food and sustenance for these disciples. So it was probably a matter of practicality. And in the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias, it's the same body of water, this lake, fresh water, there would be as many as 230 boats out on the water at a time. And so you can imagine the frustration of these disciples who had been out there all night long and had caught nothing. It's like, how could we be out here, all these other boats? And I wonder how many boats they looked at and they saw, well, they're, they've got a haul coming in there. Oh, look, they're, they're pulling in another net full over there. And yet, time and time again, they're dipping their nets, coming up with absolutely nothing to show for all that effort. So they're tired, stinky, and here they are, having caught nothing. And it's early in the morning, and there's a man standing on the shore. And they didn't realize it was Jesus. Now again, we talked about this on Easter morning, when Mary didn't at first recognize Jesus. And I said, well, because it's kind of dark. It's 
kind of hard to see and figure out in the early, those pre-dawn hours, who could be in front of you. But here, we think, how could, again, how could these disciples not at first recognize that it's Jesus? But imagine, he's a hundred yards away. How good is all your eyesight? Can you figure out who's yelling at you from a hundred yards? I'm just impressed they could hear him at that point. It's probably a little speck, like stand at one end of a football field and look toward the other goalpost. That's how far off Jesus was. And he's yelling to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? And, and this, it just says in the scripture, they answered, no. N-O, period. No. <laughs> Jesus says, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. How many of you would say, we tried that? <laughs> you don't think we cast the net off every angle of this boat in the course of the whole night while we were catching nothing? And they're like, let's just pack it in. Let's just, let's just go. But they, they listened. They heard Jesus' words, cast your net on the right side, and they did. And when they did, what happened? There was such a haul. They're bringing in this net full of fish. How many fish were there? 153. 153. There's absolutely no biblical significance to that number. <laughs> There's not. It's, it's not one of those things where they're like, well, you can add the one to the five and then add in, this is a symbol for this. No. It's just a number to show you that it's a lot of fish and that they took the time to count the fish. So we don't have to wrap our heads too much about it, but we just have to figure that there's just such an abundance. But the miracle here is what? The net didn't break. Not a tear, not a rip. No problem. They were able to just pull it in and haul this net along. And the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! Now here's something that's really interesting about that. Who is the disciple who Jesus loved? The writer of the book, John. He's the one who refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. You know, the one who was fastest in running to the tomb on Easter morning. But this is only the second time in the entire book, the entire Gospel of John, that he makes a statement. It's the Lord. The only other time we hear this disciple Quoted. The only other time he quotes himself in the writing of this book is when Jesus is telling them at the Last Supper that someone is going to betray him. And he says, Lord, who is it? That's the only other time. So he says two phrases in the whole gospel. Lord, who is it? And it's the Lord. And I think that's a really important phrase. That's, in fact, in this whole lesson. That's a phrase that catches me the most as we think about what it is to be people who are Easter people, but people who are filled with hope. Because think about those disciples and again how downcast they would have been, how tired and weary and how exhausted from fishing and catching nothing, but they hoped with enough energy, enough effort, one more time to cast the net where Christ was directing them to. When all the other fish, fishermen were probably pulling their, their nets in for the day, they were, they were finished for the night, all those other 229 boats that were probably out there, they had enough in their reserves to hope in one good haul. And then, here's the thing. When they saw what was done, when they saw this miracle, they make this proclamation. It's the Lord. It's
It's the Lord. I want you to think about how many times you pray for God to act in the midst of your circumstances. How many times in your everyday lives you pray, God, help me to have what I need when I need it. Help me to deal with this situation. But what I love here is that the very moment, the very moment that God comes through with that provision, how many of us can shout the same thing? It's the Lord. Sometimes we get so caught up explaining our circumstances and figuring out how things happen around us, but sometimes we just have to step back and look at what our good news is, and that is it's simply the Lord at work in our midst. Now, I learned about this um, when I had the privilege of serving alongside Reverend Rex Bowens in Frederick. And he was notorious for, he would say all the time, look at God. Look at God. Anytime something good happened, it didn't matter what it was, he would stop and point out that it's God at work. And a lot of times, we Christians aren't good enough at saying, it's the Lord. It's the Lord who has brought me healing. It's the Lord who has brought this check when I didn't think I'd have enough lunch money for the week. It's the Lord who has given me this opportunity to get an interview for the job that I want to have. It's the Lord. We say that's for the holy rollers, amen? Because <laughs> we all know those people. We say, yeah, you think that's God? They believe it. You know what? They're probably right. Probably right. Because we'll try to explain things like saying it's our luck, it's our circumstances. Like how many people would look at this story and say, well, certainly putting the net on the other side of the boat at that time of day, there would be a, a current that would be bringing an entire school of fish toward the tide, blah, 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 blah. No, it's the Lord. It's God in their midst, bringing exactly the blessing into their lives that they need. And they can recognize Jesus in that. They might not have been able to see his face close enough to say that this is Jesus who did this, but there was something in knowing that everything they needed was provided for them. You know how that song goes? All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. That's the proclamation we make as Easter people. That any time we see these amazing things happen, it's the Lord who is bringing it about. And Jesus brings them around to him. He's Again, he's bringing this reconciliation with all of his disciples. And he says, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples are asking, who are you at this point? They know that it's Jesus. And again, he's inviting them around this fire. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead because next week, as we read the conclusion of this story, we're going to hear... About, we're going to be reminded of Peter and his denial of Jesus. So that's one of the reasons why it's important that here at this point of the story, Jesus has a charcoal fire. Because just as Peter denied knowing Christ around the fire, he's going to bring him back into community by a fire like this. But as Jesus comes and he takes the bread, he gives it to them, he gives them the fish, and this is the third time that he appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they're either not counting Mary Magdalene or they're counting the times when he appears to the disciples in that other room, those two appearances as one. But it's, it's important that Jesus keeps showing them that he's risen. 
He keeps showing up in these really tangible, physical ways, feeding them, giving them fish and bread the way they knew he had provided for them so many times. It's this assurance that, again, you disciples aren't dreaming. I've risen here, and he's still among them. So throughout this week, or this month, and, and throughout this series, I want us to be thinking about places where we have seen the Lord. Where when something happened, you just step back and you say without a shadow of a doubt that you know how that happened, that it's the Lord, that it's God who did it. And I pray that we can share within our community some testimonies of how we've seen the Lord at work, how we as Easter people have recognized our Savior in the midst of our daily lives, bringing us our provision that we need, or, or just surprising us with what you often hear at church and in other places they'll even call God winks, those moments where it's so undeniably the presence of God that we can't do anything but stand back and say hallelujah. And praise the Lord. So as we think about those places where we point to God at work in our lives, I invite you to reflect on a time, maybe just this week, where you can say, it's the Lord. It's something that you've seen. 